Hi everyone and welcome to the latest CTO Craft Bytes. Today we'll look at how to identify developers that deliver with your technical assessment process. Our speaker today has helped companies restructure their interview uh, technical interview process and will share some tips on how to find the sweet spot by building an assessment process that allows you to focus on the candidates that really matter. If this is your first time at CTO Craft Bytes, let me tell you a little bit more about this group. CTO Craft is a mentoring and coaching community for technology leaders around the world, focusing on supporting technologists in their leadership growth. Community members are over 5,000, and CTO Craft provides them with one-on-one -on -one coaching, mentoring groups, a curated Slack community, and events like this one. Uh, from a sponsorship perspective, iTech Art is a gold partner with CTO Craft and is sponsoring today's Byte session. iTech Art is a custom software development company providing nearshore dedicated teams for VC backed startups and fast growing tech companies. And also a huge thanks to our headline partner, AWS, for helping making these Bytes events possible. I'm Glenn Roberts, I'm emceeing today's Byte session, and I'm the CTO of Digital Solutions at iTech Art. With me today is um, Julian Guionio, if I'm saying that correctly, hands-on CTO and founder at Accelerate. So Julian, welcome. Uh, please give us a short introduction about yourself. Hello. First of all, thanks for having me. I'm uh, really fond of CTO Craft and I've known Andy. He has been supporting us through the, through the process. Um, I used to be a uh, principal software consultant for a big uh, consultancy and out of the frustration of assessing developers and trying to build things that to deliver, I uh, decided to start my own soft startup and build my own product and try and solve it once and for good. I wanted to have objective data on the people that I was hiring. I'm not comfortable making gut decisions. I get emotional. Am I right? Am I wrong? Now, I just want to look at data and let the data speak. And in the process, I built a startup and started engaging with companies. And uh, we're here now, growing. Exciting, and I'm um, keen to share some of the things I found with you. It's great. Well, thanks for being here. It's great to have you with us, Julian. Um, for the audience, you can add your questions at any time from the Ask a Question link below the video. And uh, Julian's actually also said for me to contest and uh, you know complain anything that I don't agree with. So uh, this should be a very interesting conversation. And for the audience as well, if there's anything you don't agree with, please uh, pop it into a question and I'll put it forward to Julian and uh, we'll see how this goes. So to start off with then, um, let's just quickly summarize um, what do technical assessments consistly, uh, consist of? Um, the usual assessments are a take-home exercise. I send the candidate a challenge and they complete it in their own time. Then you have a pairing session, so a live coding session where you sit there with the candidate, either physically or remotely, and you work, work through a problem. Another approach is a whiteboarding exercise where you try and sketch the solution to a problem or you try and design something. Another one that's less common is a phone interview with questions where you ask questions about technologies or breadth of knowledge. And uh, I think the fifth one would be a, a small algorithmic challenge, like an online small test. But these are the assessment bits. The assessment process itself has the CV review phase, in fact, going before that is the job description, because you're filtering candidates there by what you write in the job description. Then you have your CV review, then maybe a phone call, an assessment, and another face-to-face -face interview. That's kind of the usual, the usual interview process. And okay. it could take anywhere between a few days or weeks, depending on the company. Sure. Now, just to sum it up. OK, great. So straight away, you started talking about the job description as part of an important part of the assessment process. And obviously you're tying that into the technical assessment itself. Does that mean that in the technical assessment, you only ever qualify aspects that you've identified in the job description? They go hand in hand. In fact, what you start with is why do you actually need to hire in the first place? Is it for a new project? Do you know that project or is it to replace existing staff or just to hire it when someone leaves? With that in mind, you would be, we should be able to be explicit about what you need. For example, if someone leaves, say they're working on a Python backend, you need someone who knows Python and because they're joining an existing project, an existing team, they need to know a bit of refactoring, they have to have some experience. If the team is doing uh, TDD properly, then you expect them to have place driven development. So straight from the get-go, you know exactly what they need to be focusing on when they come into the office. 
or remotely. That needs to be reflected back into the job description. First, to manage expectations and also to give you a list of things that you need to test for. So just go secretly. And then more of that, once you hire someone, you need to also be keeping track of their productivity. Are they succeeding? But in fact, I'm going to say hiring is easy. Anyone can hire. Yeah, if someone comes to the door, CV looks good, here's an offer, you accept it, you come to the office. Building teams that can deliver is hard. The person you've hired might not be successful, might disrupt the team, it might, it might have a detrimental effect. In fact, a bad hire costs 10 times more than missing out on a candidate. So to answer your question, yeah, definitely. The job description needs to reflect what they need to be doing in their day-to-day -day job and the experience they need to have. And then your entire process is around assessing that uh, that is the case. So covering all the items. If an item is not important, maybe it shouldn't be in the job description. Okay. Actually, just on this, there's a bugbear that I've had since um, I was a younger developer where I was leaving a company and the C well, it wasn't a CTO role, but the person that was in charge of the technical team at the time determined that, oh yeah, you can leave early as long as we find a replacement. But the um, job description he gave out was not for my role. I was a PHP developer, full stack, and he was asking for Java because his mindset was, you know, only, you know, you need to be a more, you know, a different type of language to be a good developer. So therefore I want Java in the job experience, even though none of the roles that we worked on have anything to do with Java. Would you agree with me that was a bad idea or do you see some validity to that? I think it's a bad idea. Okay, good. Just making sure there. The, the best job description is the one when you already have a project in mind and you're brave enough to put the project description in the job description. For example, you're building a new product that requires a Python. I just picked on Python, but could as well be in Java. Uh, a Python backend for a new uh, trading app. You know exactly what you're going to be building, and you can throw in the technologies there, but they're not as important. And reflect that in the job description. When, when a developer reads it, they know what they'll be working on, they can imagine it, they can visualize it, and the tech stack. So they will immediately start to solutionize because that's what we do. So when I see a when I see a uh, a project specification, I'm already starting to design, so I'm already hooked. As opposed to just providing a general job description, where we need a Python developer with five years of experience working with microservices, plus driven development, all the keywords doesn't mean anything. Yeah, so actually giving an example of what the daily job is actually going to consist of. Yeah. And do you actually tie that into the technical assessment process then? So if you know that you are building in Python or Django with microservices, that your technical assessment will be focused purely on that type of technology stack and that language? Uh, yes and no. You take all the items and then for each of them, you identify how important they are. I can, I can learn another web framework in about two weeks. So I don't need to test for it because I know if the developer is good, they can pick it up. Whilst I can't learn how to program or test, do test-driven development in a matter of months. Even people that say they do test-driven development, they might not be doing it well because now it stands for, yeah, I write tests, then I do test-driven development. So the important bits are, for me, the development technique, like how do you do what you do? How do you design? How do you craft your code? How do you deliver? Then speed, are you proficient? Because if you just learn how to do it, how to structure, how, how to do object-oriented programming and test driven development, you're gonna spend hours and hours on the same problem, just mulling over it. Whilst I need you to deliver, not to learn how to do it. Um, and thirdly, sometimes the breadth of knowledge does matter. If we're using a database as a document database, yeah, you do expect, expect people to have work with a document database because it has some quirks. Or if you're using queuing systems, you want people that have been exposed to these technologies. The question is, how fast can they pick it up? If it's weeks, don't bother adding it to the job description. If it's months, then yeah, probably. You, you're going to think twice because otherwise you need to invest time in that uh, particular hire to be successful. So that's my answer. It depends. Okay. So let's talk about seniority then. So let's say hypothetically you're building a new team that is going to be working in Python for microservices and you get plan to hire one lead, two seniors, 
and two juniors or something like that. Would the technical assessment be the same for all seniority types? Comes back to what they need to be doing. So first of all, how do you establish that you need a junior? As cost savings and doers, people that can just ex, uh, you know export, you know actually produce something out of that side. So obviously, you know, when I say junior, I don't mean grad. I mean you know one or two years experience. There'll be some front end UX work, you know, something like that. So if the project is you know something that's very standalone project where you know a mix of seniorities is suitable for this purpose, but the technical stack is going to be the same. Um, my question is, would you give a different type of technical assessment test? to the different role levels yes and yeah you would so you'd have a separate because, test per yeah. user because you're trying to assess different things like for a junior it's more important that they can get the job done like can you can you write some code that passes those specifications then you might not be as fast and as productive as a senior but you can do it or you might not get it to the quality level we want to in terms of test, test coverage and how it hangs together, but at least I know you can deliver something. In fact, if you look at the career progression of the dev, I'm, I'm going to talk from my experience. After finishing uni, my first role was for a startup. And I built, I think in two years, I wrote like 500,000 lines of code, really a hacker. I just, I just went for it no tests or just manual tests it was all over the place so in fact a junior will be able to deliver a lot in a short period of time but they will create a lot of technical depth and problems in the process then after being bitten by what i did i went down the route of software design and uh, test driven development but that made me worse because i would spend i would spend weeks to deliver a simple a simple feature to the best level of quality. It was impacting the business because I wasn't delivering. I was just trying to get my head around how to structure code. And I was very slow and very bad at it. I actually was writing, for one feature, I was writing hundreds of tests because I felt the need to cover all the test cases. It felt that I was getting better, but in terms of productivity, I was worse than I was before. And then once you get past that hurdle and you realize that you need to balance speed and uh, quality and test driven techniques such as test driven development and design experience will help you move faster then you actually break away from the past and start becoming truly productive so when you when you when i assess juniors i want them to be in that first space can you deliver i'm not that bothered about your quality and your tests but i want you to deliver when i assess seniors i don't want them to be in that state where they're gonna spend weeks and weeks focusing on quality. I want them to go past that. They, they need to know how, they, how to use the test properly, how to design quickly, and how to deliver at speed. So they have to come past. But it's the middle ground that is uh, the, dangerous, the danger area. Okay. I mean, I'll contest you a little bit on this. I think I'm probably in the minority with my view, um, but essentially the, the type of test that I do, I have a different bar for the seniority level, but they're all very similar. So essentially there's not that much differences between the key type of testing. And I will just, you know, we'll cover that shortly. Um, but for me, you know, obviously you're expecting different answers, better answers as we move forward. And what you were talking about there about the cultural aspects and the way they code, that's parts, that's a discussion piece of, oh, by the way, I know, you know, you you said that you always do test driven development, but we're a startup, we need to move faster. So therefore we skip some of the tests. Is that okay with you? Or the opposite way around, you come from a startup or you come from fast coding. We need the tests in place. Is this a problem for you? And the culture that you implement from the more senior members of the team with the code review process will correct that from that perspective. But you feel that you want to try and discount that risk by having different tests at the interview stage. So all you did, all I just said, delivery speed and the test driven development, so the development technique can be seen hands on with a technical challenge. Yeah. So I can see how they code. I can see what they did. I can, I can judge their technical skills based on that. It's not just the subjective aspect. The reason why I use different tests is because a junior will not be able to complete a senior challenge. They just can't. Uh, okay. Because it's, it will, they could, but it will take them hours. Sure. 
Okay. Like that. As, as you can tell, delivery speed is very important for me. It, yeah. And I know this is rarely discussed, but we're not just hiring developers. One of the requirements is we're hiring someone who can deliver at speed. We can't wait for them to just deliver this functionality. We want them down in a week or a month, depending on. So with your hires, you want a fast uh, onboarding time and from the day to kick off really quickly, which is what you're focusing on in your technical assessment process. And not necessarily to kick up very quickly. I think delivery speed equals seniority to some extent. Extent. If you know what you're doing, you should be able to do it quick enough. If you've mastered your IDE, your development technique, your language, you should have no problem solving a technical challenge. And also you shouldn't have no problem delivering this feature because you've used Django and you've used Python. Yeah, it's just another web page or an API. And that's where I'm coming from. Okay. Cool. We've got loads of questions in coming from the audience. So I'm going to start cracking through some of those. Um, so the first one then, um, what would you say is the ideal or optimal number of technical assessment rounds you should do? Um, yeah, so let's start off with that because it's two-parter. So the question is the optimal assessment optimal. rounds. Yeah, how many should you do? The overall process. Yeah, what's the optimal number of technical assessment rounds? So obviously not including um, the other aspects of the um, interview process, I would say. All right. You should have one technical assessment round where you cover everything that you can cover objectively. So my ideal process is, yeah, you have your job description. Out of that job description, identify the things that can be tested objectively and uh, knowledge of Python or Java plus test-driven development plus uh, software quality. They, they can all be covered by a tech test. What can't be tested is the social aspect and also the breadth of knowledge, like deployments and uh, infrastructure and architecture, all these principles. So you'd have an objective test, which is a tech test. Then you have a subjective, which is a face-to-face -face discussion. Then on top of that, because it's a candidate-driven market, you need a phone call with a candidate where you don't test, but you sell your company and your product. That's when your job becomes real. That's what will make them engage with your assessment process. If you're just sending tests to people, they're not going to do it because they're going to look at it and say, yeah, that's a, just another test. I don't know if there's going to be a role at the end of the test. I don't know if uh, I would like the role. I don't know enough about the, camp, the company to engage with it. So I might not do it. But if, I, if the candidate has a chat with me and I go into detail describing what the project is like, what they're going to be doing, then it's likely that they will engage. I mean, you're absolutely right. Essentially, for candidates, the assessment process for the interviews is a determining factor of whether they want the job. You're not just assessing the candidate, the candidate is assessing you yeah. and your and your whole interview process will be considered as part of that. So, yeah, that's very important. And also part of the same question as before. Um, what do you think of panel technical interviews? So as you're talking about trying to cover everything in one batch, one if you said, okay, there's your technical test and then doing a panel one with certain members of the team, would that be appropriate? Is that a good way to determine um, a successful hire? If that panel interview is focused, right? you don't just do an interview because you want to chat with the candidate. You want to get, to, you, you want to get some answers out of it. So for example, if you've done your tech test, and it gave you insights into their coding skills, then what you need to cover is very clear. Like you need to cover some architectural discussions or you need to cover some infrastructure and you need to cover the pairing, soft skills, team, team fit. Then I'll say we need to cover these three items. You're gonna advise the questions and then you have the panel. And the reason why you have the panel is to reduce noise because uh, of the subjective, the subjective nature you want multiple opinions just to reduce the chance of you just getting it, getting it wrong. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So to go back on one of the previous questions, um, one of the questions for the audience is, um, I agree. It's, one second. People are moving, people are voting things up and it's moved it around for me. Sorry. One second. Uh, all right, where is it? I, okay, okay. I agree to say um, it's, um, I, I agree that it's true to say that someone, anyone can learn any framework quickly, yeah. but would you say it's important to ensure that they are happy to move towards a particular framework if it's important for your project or team? And how do you actually assess that? So essentially, if you're hiring for Python and this person comes from a Java background and they say they're happy to learn, you know, different language or different framework, maybe they're Python with Django and now they want to use, you know, you're using Flask. 
how do you actually assess that piece? How could you possibly do that in a technical assessment process? That's what you do with a, let's say, a 15 minute call where you sell your project. Is that you're just managing expectations. Look, this is the project we're working on. We want to move to this framework or we want to use this technology. The candidate might drop out of the process at that time, which is perfectly fine. I know some candidates only want to use the latest technology. So if you're not using, say, AWS Lambdas, they might not going to work with you, which is perfectly fine. At least, at least you got that upfront and not during the final stage where you, where you went to the motions. So you'd always do that telephone call before you do a technical assessment? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's very Great. important to sell your role. Otherwise, people are not going to, are not going to engage with your assessment process. Cool. And how long should that call be? 15 Finish. minutes max. Okay. 20 Great. minutes. It, enough to get to know someone. Great. I mean, I've been doing that just on my own accord anyway, so it's good that I'm aligned in the same way there. Um, okay, then. So carrying on with the audience, um, do you have any advice on how to ensure a consistent scoring level um, coming back from technical assessments? If you're using different tests for different levels, how do you um, how do you know which level test to put the candidate through? So I think there are multiple questions there. How do you decide whether you're talking to a junior or a senior? Yep, and how do you ensure consistent scoring level as well? Right. So on that, then your job description, and you allow the candidate to apply. If they're applying for a senior role, then they go through the senior part. If they're applying to a junior role, then they go to the junior assessment pipeline with the expectation that uh, the salary, the rate is going to be lower. And the second question is consistency. Um, simple, just use objective assessments. Use Accelerate, by the way. <laughs> Um, a tech test with clear objectives and clear scoring. You, the danger is if you have, say, a tech test for a senior developer and then the result is being manually reviewed by different members of the teams at different times, then you're not going to get a consistency. You're going to try and get as much metric as possible. Well, at Accelerate, we use speed, speed as a proxy for speed as a proxy for experience and skills and everything translates into speed we have multiple rounds like the, the take home challenge is not just here's some spec you need to implement it's like a simulation of a real world process you start small with some few requirements then they add up and it forces the candidate to refactor if they're good they're going to do it quickly if they're not they're going to stumble and and then you can also measure things like uh, code coverage as another good indicator of, uh, whether someone is writing tests and how they're writing it. But you get a lot of signal from the, from a challenge. And then I agree, the code quality aspect, is the code readable? Only a human can look at it and say, yeah, it is readable. But on that, you can have uh, multiple team members have a look at the code. If it's, if it's easier to, to look at, then yeah. Okay, so touching on that then, um, who should actually be reviewing the technical assessments? Should it always be the same person, just so there's that consistency? Or are you purely looking at, you know, you can't purely look at a numbers base. They got the question right or wrong, isn't really as clear when it comes to code level um, assessments. So should it always be one person or could you distribute this out to multiple members of the team? Having one person is good, but you can't scale it. So it's good to start with, for example, when, when the hiring volumes are low, I like to do all the assessments and all the interviews because it will give me the consistency. But when you have to deal with multiple candidates, multiple CVs, it's good to have at least two people doing the subjective test. So you can gain a lot from the objective metrics, but then if you want to look at code quality, code structure, you always have to, even for CV reviews, because that's also subjective, you want to have at least two people looking at it. In fact, I ran, a, I ran an interesting experiment where I said, we're going to do blind CV reviews. So we'll always review the CVs, provide the feedback, and then share it with people and uh, discuss about the points that we don't agree. It took us 200 CVs in two months to come to a clear set of guidelines for how to review a CV consistently. We were all over the place and, and yeah, we were looking for different things, which meant that if I gave the CV to one person, they would say no. And if I give it to another, they'll say yes. So then 
you need to be constantly reducing the noise and achieving consistency because otherwise you're not going to be able to improve. If, if there's too much randomness, anything you change, it's going to be random as well. Okay. I think that's the same problem in the recruitment industry as well. I know when I've been applying for like quite senior positions, I've got, you know, I'm there thinking that's an awesome CV. I send it out and I hear nothing back. And I go, well, this isn't working. I fill it with a load of keywords and suddenly everyone's responding to me saying, oh, yeah, we'd love to talk further. So um, I think there's a recruitment issue process there as well before they even get into your pipeline. So obviously trying to stabilize your pipeline for the interview process is important as well. But if you can feed that into the recruitment stage so they're aware of what your rules are as well, I think that would help that process. I assume that in your experience, you've been utilizing recruiters as well as the technical assessment. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Okay. Um, so on, on that, most of the things you look at in the CV are not going to be useful for a recruiter. They have a different, a different role. Yeah, they can look for keywords. That's what they do. And seniority and past employments. But for example, if I'm hiring for a uh, web ops, DevOps person, I want to see evidence that they've hands-on worked on platform engineering. By hands-on, I mean they've actually done things other than just being in a project that happened to use AWS. Yeah, we're using AWS, but you've not done Terraform or yourself. Your team has been doing it, but you've not done it. And from my experience, I can see that through the CV, but the recruiter will not be able to say it. Yeah. Okay. Right then. So one of the bigger questions, I've got seven upvotes for this question here. So we hear a lot about how candidates uh, being in so much demand that they'll duck out of the process when there are time consuming technical tests in favor of other easier processes. How do you suggest that we maintain a technical assessment confidence whilst not losing the candidate? The key bit for me is the 15 minute sales call where you engage with a candidate. If they like your company and your role, they would be putting in the effort. They will be spending one, two, three hours. They will put in the effort. If they're not convinced by the role, they'll duck out anyway. So, okay. Yeah. So it's a pre-vetting stage. As long as you've managed to sell your vision of the business and their role to yeah. them, then they're less likely to duck out no matter how many stages you have as part of your assessment process. Yeah. In fact, it's the opposite. If you had a positive interaction with them, and they're really excited about working for you, then they would want to prove themselves. Because even all developers know that the CVs are padded and they're not really reflective of what they know. And people want to show their skills. And I, mean, I like doing tests. I like, I like to challenge myself. It's a test for me as well. And uh, it's an objective way of uh, showing my skills, apart from experience GitHub and all the other projects. OK, so just to contest that, Mark T has also said the uh, same thing I was thinking of is what now that you've told everyone, all the CTOs of this group to do this and every company starts doing this pre-sales call to them. Um, if everyone's doing it, then potentially the path of least restriction is still likely to be where the new can where the candidates likely to go because of this issue. So if everybody's doing the sales call, selling the business and the role to them, and they say they're in the process for five or six and they go, well, I'm not, I can't take that much time off to go to do the interviews. I don't want to spend that much time at home. Um, how is there anything you can do to actually still promote further that these assessment stages are suitable to them um, in a beneficial way? The, the way I'm thinking is each stage is going to show them a bit more about their role. So therefore, they understand the role and it's sort of an onboarding opportunity as part of that. So the, the two things here. You're assuming that uh, candidates don't want to do a tech, te tech test? Oh, well, they don't want to do too many, or I'd say. Yeah, that's true. If, they, if you want to get a job in, let's say, one week, and you're going to prioritize the ones that the companies that you like and the tech test that you think you're going to be able to complete based on their complexity. Um, it comes back to am I interested in, am I really interested in that role? And then if all, if all things equal, then uh, down to the candidate. As a candidate, if I take a more difficult tech test and put in the effort, I know that the competition will be lower. So I'm able to stand out amongst the other candidates. If I'm always taking the same, let's say a hacker algorithm challenge, I know everyone does it. It's like a screening test. 
it's not going to flag me as a very good developer. Whilst if I do a, a proper take home challenge and I take my time to do it, I'm going to increase my chances of getting that role. So as a candidate, in fact, I can tell you a real story, but it might be just me. It was four years ago, I interviewed for a contractual role at a bank and they had this uh, take home challenge. I did the take home challenge. I was really keen to do it because I wanted to show my skills and uh, I was proud of my TDD and the way I've architected everything. I go to the face to face interview and uh, the interviewer starts talking about architecture and infrastructure and other things unrelated to what I just did. And then I pop the question What do you think about what I did, about the challenge? What did you find there? And uh, yeah, it, it was good. The, the tech team said it was good. So yeah, we called you in for an interview. So you haven't had a look at it. Uh, no, someone else did. Uh, that was a big red flag for me. Uh, they, they were not appreciating the time candidate put into the process. And they were not even getting the insights. It was just a yes or a no. Like, did you manage to submit it or not? So I, I've said no on the basis of that. Okay. Well, okay. So let me give it a quick um, example about me, actually. So when I was working in smaller startups, we had no budgets, we had no recruiters, uh, we were only hiring juniors. So therefore, you know, it's at the lower wage bracket side of things in London. And my process was, you know, because there's no recruiters, you get about 100, 120 CVs in. Um, so you try and cut them down to about 20 or 15, you know, just from keywords, are they in country or not, that type of thing. Then, you know, that 15 minute sales call, so vital. So it's not just sales, it's a quick validation of, do they know the basics of what I'd expect for the role, a bit about the experience, and then talking about the role to try and get them engaged in that means they don't need to take the time off work. They can fit it in their lunch break or after work and, you know, there's no pressure and then cut it down to about four or five candidates um, just to then bring into the office to actually do the technical test. Um, if I didn't wasn't sure about them, then with doing a code review off, you know, an offline technical test, be it a challenge or something else like that, because as a developer, I've gone through so many processes. I said, okay, right, here's a technical challenge, but you don't have to do it. If you've done one with another company, just send me that instead. So essentially I can review something else that you've done in the past. That's been a, like, a, you know, one of these technical challenges rather than you wasting more time to do this again. Um, you can just send me that one and I'll review that code, that challenge and that code instead of, you know, doing the same thing over and over. Because if you are applying for 10 roles and you're doing 10 technical challenges, you're going to go for the wall. And what Joe C's just mentioned actually on the chat, which is quite interesting, is that they're essentially still got the problem that they're not inclusive because it's making assumptions that everyone has free time to spend on these types of challenges and then with the actual technical with the actual technical test itself it wasn't hands-on coding it was more pseudo coding so you know you'd ask about the experience ask some questions in there to see whether they actually worked in that technology what they actually did but then i'll give them a tough challenge and i wouldn't expect them to know the answer i'd expect them to try and do some coding get stuck and then work together to find the answer to prove whether i feel that relationship could work with me and them rather than expect someone just to get the answer out right if they got the answer out right i'd throw it away and give them a harder one you know because essentially getting the answer right doesn't actually prove whether i can work with them whether they can understand me whether we can solve challenges together or not if i can give some direction and they can complete it that's what i was looking for so um, what's your view on my challenge there is it sounds to me that the interview process pretty much revolves around your experience and your perception of the candidate Yes, it, it, yeah, I, I completely agree. It's a very perceptive view of the hiring process where I was hiring in this role. It wasn't numbers driven. It was, do I believe I can work with them? And yes, it's more on your heart rather than a numbers driven decision on that hire. I don't always consider that a bad thing. I think, you know, because the, the attitude, the way they approach problems is what you're hiring them for. They're trying to solve problems. They're not just knocking out standard code. Yeah, that's, that, that is valuable. But I wouldn't hire anyone who had I've not seen coding. Okay, so this is a prime example then. So you would have to see them in real time write code for you to feel that you could validate them as a potential hire. <clears throat> yep. Um, and back, let's settle this debate. It's uh, candidate experience versus hiring outcomes. Well, I'm, all the assessments that I add I add them because they're crucial for the business. Well, look, I'm paranoid. I don't want to hire someone who I then have to fire in a month's time because they're not delivering. And I don't want to hire someone who's going to drag my team down productivity wise. And from that belief, I, I need to put the assessment steps, gates in place 
that will give me the confidence to hire someone. So all the assessment that I add, it's not just because the industry deems them appropriate or because this is how people do it. It's because the insights that they give me are crucial for me making that hiring decision or not. So if the candidate doesn't want to do it, or I can't, for example, I can't see them doing test-driven development. You've written on your CV that you can do TDD. Show me how you do it, and then I'm going to assess if you can do it or not. On, on that basis, I need to see them coming, either as a live session or as a recorded session by a take-home challenge. Okay, so I have seen cases on the CTO Craft community where people have actually come along and said, I was running an interview, I said there's a technical test, and they said, I'm not doing that, I'm too senior for a technical test, and walked out. Would you think that's fair? Would you say, okay, that's not the right person for you because there's no way you can validate them if you don't see them code? Well, my thinking is, if you're senior, you should be able to do our challenge in one hour. What this tells me is that your senior experience-wise, yeah, you've had 10 years of experience, but not skills-wise. If you're really a, a true senior developer, you're going to churn out code like in no time. Okay. So if anyone says, I refuse to do a technical test, you wouldn't even give them the time of day. You'd say, that's fine. You're at the process if you don't agree to do a technical test. From my perspective, I don't have enough data to make a confident decision. Okay. So okay. I'm, not, I'm not willing to take the risk. Okay. Okay, great. Um, right then. So let's just go back to some of the audience questions again. I think that's been a, an interesting conversation anyway. Um, what's your opinion of takeaway coding tests versus an in-person video conference coding session as an assessment? So would you say that there's seeing them do it in real time or doing it offline? Is there value to one or the other in your view? They fulfill different roles. Now, when you're doing a live coding exercise, you're not really assessing their coding skills. You're, you're assessing their pairing skills how they talk to the problem, how they interact with you, how they, yeah, it's a very stressful situation to do it online and live. Um, my preference is offline in their own time with their own, another key thing, with their own setup. So tools, IDs, time, everything, because I want them to perform at their best. I want to see how, how well they do it when they do it. When you do a pairing session, it's about collaboration and social and team fit. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Right then. So yeah, I'll just look at the other questions at the same time. So how do you actually remove the bias then? So if you, we've been talking about saying, you know, you can try and work on numbers, you know, you're trying to take the bias out of the CV process. You're trying to take the bias out of the technical assessment piece. How do you actually take the bias out of that? Because as we say, it's not just a, a score out of 10 you get, you're looking at the the tests, you're looking at the object orientated programming method they've used or whatever that might be. Um, how is the best way to achieve that? Uh, which biases we're talking about? Um, so it, how do you move bias in your in your hiring process? So essentially, if we are talking about code, so if I if you've got two developers and they've both solved the problem in two different directions, and one person says that's the right way of doing it, you know, and another developer in your organization, that's the other one, obviously there's clear bias in the approach. So is, is there a way of actually removing that bias with um, the technical assessment process? Uh, not really, but you can put a uh, much higher weight on the objective data. Say a candidate completed the challenge, right? <clears throat> and uh, you have candidate A, they've uh, done the challenge in four hours, wrote no tests, and uh, carefully designed everything up front. So upfront design, no tests, nothing. Then another candidate, they did it, let's say, in three hours with test driven development and maybe not so much design, but just the data is one candidate did it faster with test coverage, the other candidate did it slower. That bears a lot of weight. The, the end result, yes, it's subjective. Some developers will like the first approach, others will like the second one. That is the debate, but the metrics will weight heavily on uh, selecting the second candidate. Okay, so when you hire, do you prefer attitude or ability? Ability. Ability. Yeah, ability. ability comes first. My belief is with a good tech lead, people manager, they can get the best out of the people and get them to work together and achieve remarkable results. When we hire for people's attitude and put skills the latter is because we're afraid. 
we're not in control of our teams and we want to make sure that the teams get along well and the delivery is a second art secondary artifact Okay, I mean, for me, I'm more about attitude. Essentially, with the right attitude, the developer can, be can become anything I I want them to be. You know, essentially because it's the direction I'm going with. So therefore, you know, you you definitely prefer a less strong, you know, great personality and push person against a a, a dick expert. You know, essentially, you know, a sort of a whole person that can't get on with the team. And as you say, you know, you will try and disqualify them throughout the interview stages anyway. But I always lean more heavier towards the attitude capability than the ability. But obviously, for scale, I don't think you can do that. So if you are hiring a lot of roles and you need um, large scale in your organization, you probably don't have the time to offer the mentoring and the relationships that you would normally do. Then if you're in a startup where I'm only hiring two or three people, they're going to sit next to me all day. I know I can focus on if I focus on the attitude bit, the ability will come with my direction. Well, so, I think that's a loaded question. I, I value both. That's, that's the answer. But in my assessment process, the technical skills come first. That's it. Um, as in order to get hired, you need to pass both tests. And that's why we do a cultural fit, a face-to-face. -face. You, you don't just hire someone based on the, of the tech test. You go through this and you yeah. add to it does matter. If that's your first point and it matters more than the technical skills, maybe that should be the first interview step. Okay. If yeah, I've just, see, just seen the comments. I think a lot of people are sort of on my side on this one where they say, you know, um, attitudes first, technical second. And as you say, you know, if you organize your interview process where you are validating attitude before technical, then that would try and discount that piece. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it can be seen both ways. For scale, like I'm an agency, so therefore we hire about 50 people a week at the moment across Belarus, Poland and uh, Ukraine. Um, there are heavy technical assessments as part of those stages. I'm not part of it. I haven't got the time to deal with that. Um, but, you know, with that type of thing, because we're a sought after company in these regions, we can put in heavy technical requirements where if you are a small startup, you can't, you, need, you know, your ability is to move fast. You haven't got multiple decision makers. If I see someone I like him, I can literally tell him as he's going out the door, say, look, I'm going to give you an offer tonight where in a large organization, you can't do that. You have to run up to the VP of engineering or get approval from CEO or something like that to actually get the approval process done. So I think depending on where you are inside the organization, what type of organization it is and what you actually value, that's determining which way you lean in that situation. But that's, that's how I see it. Yeah. Okay then, so actually going back slightly to my question where I said before um, that if someone, if I'm given a coding challenge to do at home and um, I say to them, you, if you've already done a coding challenge at another organization, feel free to present that to me instead. Um, one of the questions from the audience is, what do you think about tech assessments, which is of the bring me some code you've written style? So that would qualify as, you know, my approach the way I did it, or if they've got GitHubs, which you can review, is that enough? Or do you need to see them code live or fix a challenge that you've actually set for them? And the end result of a bit of code doesn't provide you a lot because you need a context. And also you need the time it took to, for that to be produced. Like if you just, in fact, the way we judge quality is to the perspective of future requirements. And code in itself doesn't have any quality if it's not going to be used. The, the quality comes from being able to extend the code to accommodate future, the future. So unless you have the context in which that code has been produced, you're not going to be able to assess quality. The only bit that I can assess is, yes, you can write some bit of Java or Python, and you can write a test. But I don't know how you got and why you got to this stage. OK. I mean, obviously, I'd assume they'd provide me what the challenge was for the code they provided to me. So essentially, you know, a prime example is I got one of these challenges where it's like, write, write an FBI system. And I was just yeah. like, I'm not going to do that. That's going to be like four hours worth of work on a weekend, and I've got other stuff to do. So, um, but, you know, if they've already done one of these in the past, and, you know, you know what the challenge is and how they did it, and you can ask how long did it take you, I don't, I don't have that problem asking that question. So if I ever do give a at home test, I say, okay, please just let me know how long it took you. I assume it's going to take an hour, but if you took longer because you wanted to get it right, that's fine. If you did it bang on an hour, but it's not quite right, then at least I understand how fast you can move at the current status. You touched on an interesting thing. Like the traditional tape on challenge where you send someone a requirement like implement an FBI system, it's fundamentally broken because you've not constrained it. Like yeah. I can implement that in one hour, I solve the problem, or I can spend 10 hours trying to pad it. Um, I can do it in multiple ways with frameworks, with languages. I can just go crazy. 
how can you consistently compare results? Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, you, I mean, they did give me some functionality they expected in it, but yeah, it was very high level and there was no clarity of what they expected from that at all. So yeah, that's, um, I, I didn't agree with that approach either. So I didn't actually do that one. So, uh, so that's fair enough. And okay. For the candidate, for you, when you look at it, what do I actually need to do? And uh, you're trying to judge the time. Can I do it in one hour, 10 hours? What's the expectation here? Sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. Sure. Right, so as we were talking about actually the technical assessment process and the questions that you ask, um, what is a good way to actually create a technical question bank? What is a good way to train the team to conduct the technical interview? So if it's not just you doing it, uh, you talked about everyone sitting together about creating the CV process. So if you are actually creating the technical assessment test questions, how would you actually do that? How do you actually say this is an appropriate question or this is the appropriate part of the test and this isn't? And making sure everyone that's doing the technical assessment then the interviewing stage of it is aware of what to look for and what not to look for i think this comes just from running the, the interviews over and over again with with coaching like pairing on doing the interviews you never do it alone especially if it's subjective and you're asking questions because you have multiple opinions and multiple views and now uh, with time that's what i found you get the consistency if you have the same people involved in the same process. Okay, so it's a trial and error process. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that sounds great. Okay, so how much weight would you actually put in? So if you get a CV with GitHub links and you were talking about standard code not being that valuable to you because you don't know how long it took them, you don't know what their constraints were, how do you actually um, review a GitHub of uh, the candidate that's been presented? So how much time or weight would you actually put against the GitHub that was shared with you? Is it worth nothing or is it actually in some value? I would definitely look at the code. Oh, yeah. Um, for example, if the candidate said they're doing test-driven development, but they've not written any tests in their GitHub code, then that's a red flag. Or if they've uh, not even added a readme explaining what the project is and how to run it, those sort of things, that's another red flag. So it's all signal. It's up to you to use it. Okay. Uh, but I'm not going to... I'm not going to be able to make a hiring decision solely based on GitHub. Sure, sure. So it's, it's an indicator for the initial validation check rather than saying, okay, this guy's GitHub's amazing. Uh, we have to hire him. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, what are the other questions from the audience then? Um, uh, this person works in a high growth organization. So, uh, very difficult in advance to know exactly which role or position the candidate might be, end up being in. Um, any advice on how to describe the position role or role in advance? So in other words, there are many options to be able to keep the candidate engaged. So this is a prime example for us as well with the same thing, because we're constantly hiring so many people, you know, what role that, you know, we don't clearly define the role. We say we're looking for strong developers and then we find a suitable role in our organization for them. How, how you know, is that is that an appropriate way or would you say it should be a clearly defined role so you can clearly sell them on the opportunity? Or by not having it clearly defined, is that a set upsell capability to the candidate as well by saying, do you know what? We've got so much scaling at the moment. We'll find the right role for you. It's better to be honest and upfront. I mean, I worked for a consultancy and the key selling point was, look, you're going to be exposed to so many projects with so many techs. You're going to learn a lot. And that, that was the selling point for me, uh, which means that, you know, in order to succeed, you had a, had a good basic understanding of uh, programming languages and development techniques. Sure. And you focus on those areas rather than the specifics of each individual project. Okay. I see one question from the audience saying, what if the candidate only has private repos? Well, you can't review it then, I'm afraid, uh, Dennis. <laughs> so, um, okay, so here's one. So sharing a private repo will probably be a red flag. Exactly, because you shouldn't be sharing information that is, I'd assume, would be private for a reason, especially if it's, I mean, okay, here's another question for you then. So if you're interviewing a candidate, he says, look, I'm an excellent coder, I can show you, and then he shows you something from a production system. Let's say they work for an e-commerce store and obviously gives you access to the, the Bitbucket or the Jira account or some, you know, some way for you to view this. Would that be a red flag saying, okay, this guy can't be trusted because he shouldn't be sharing existing businesses code? Yeah, definitely. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I fully agree yeah. with that as well. <laughs> Integrity and honesty and all that is very important. Absolutely. And as you say, that's part of the interview process, but not really part of the um, technical assessment part. That's part of a different stage of the interview process. Yeah. OK, um, so with more, more and more companies hiring teams wanting to follow interview techniques or patterns or strategies set forth by existing tech companies like Google, um, 
how can a hiring team determine how much time is needed to assess a candidate te technically? So in other words, how long should this process take? If you look at the Google process, because they're Google, you know, they can take months to do that. So essentially, how do you actually quantify how long your organization should take from a candidate applying to actually a job offer being given? It's a fine trade off. I mean, you're not Google, you're not going to be able to do that. And uh, as we talked before, increasing the length of the assessment process might put some people off, which means it's your personal choice on how much insights you get during the interview process. How comfortable are you with making the making your hiring decisions after spending one or two hours with a candidate. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I mean, some people are, more, I mean, I'm one of them. I'd like to know more for more objective data, but you can do it as well with less, less data. But you have a, you run a higher risk of uh, making a bad hire. As we're talking about high, bad hires, um, I like uh, Gary V, and one of the statements he came out with was people have their egos tied up in hiring. So therefore, they're too cautious about the hiring process. And then if they are the wrong hire, um, they won't let them go. So my question is, are egos tied up into hiring? And how do you actually validate that the hire you've made is actually good? Yes, egos are tied up into hiring. It's very hard to accept that you've made a bad hiring decision especially if you were there in a room with that individual and said, yeah, I think this person is going to be a good fit. And it's hard to admit that you're wrong and it's even harder to let someone go. Like I've, I've seen people not being, uh, not being made redundant and just stayed in role, causing disruption to the team and projects for months and months until management changed and someone said, this, this has to stop. Um, and what was the second question? Um, how do you actually validate that the hire was actually a successful hire? Uh, this goes back to, uh, this is a topic for a completely other discussion. How do you measure productivity? How do you know that they're, they're successful? What sort of things you track? And off the record, the best metrics is how the other people in the team perceive the candidate. If the candidate is not succeeding or it's either not delivering or is toxic to the team, they will they will sideline the individual you'll see people not wanting to work with him they their pull requests or reviews are not being looked at or they're not being reviewed people find ways to to punish someone out of their just which is not good in itself yeah. team members will tell you when you need to let someone go because it's disrupting their work and it's making them feel miserable Okay. And then we're going into um, uh, delivery management and team management and how, you know, how to do all that. So that's a whole conversation yeah. in itself, isn't it? So one thing we haven't actually touched on is what should you not be screening for? Well, I think the obvious ones are any personal stuff. So in, in fact, CVs don't have a predictive value. At all. Like experience, Maybe the only interesting thing about the CV is the role. Right? Are you a developer? Have you used Python before? Yes, no. Uh, the rest, I, I think it's just noise. Once you have the objective metrics, yeah, I know I can, I know you can do the job. I know you can deliver. And then, yeah, I don't think I'm answering this question properly. Um. Essentially, when we were talking before, you were talking about, you know, if you're clarifying what you do actually want in the organization, then anything outside of that is going to be of less value. So therefore, you know, the biggest problem of two different two different people interviewing two different candidates is the bias piece. So um, essentially, when we were talking previously, we were talking about um, identify, you know, not, you know, not actually validating aspects that we know we don't care about. So if, you know, they've got uh, front end capabilities, it's like, well, we don't actually care about that. That's not actually a requirement of the role or anything like that. Yeah. So, okay, cool. So uh, we're always coming to the end of time now. So we've had lots of questions from the audience, a lot of interaction, which has been fantastic. And uh, thank you for letting me, uh, you know, fight back a little bit. It's always fun to, it's a challenge. Um, what would you say would be the key takeaways for the audience? So what, how would you try to summarize this up of what, you know, of what they should take away as the most important thing as part of their technical interview um, hiring process? So key takeaway, the job description should be a reflection of what they're going to be doing in the day-to-day -day job. 
and the assessment process is there to validate the job description. And uh, yeah. And uh, in order for the candidate to engage with your process, you need to sell your project slash company first. You can't really get away without that. And then secondly, in order to remove bias, you should use as much objective data as possible. Uh, because with that, and by not looking too much at the CV, you're going to accept different people from different backgrounds in. Okay. And any particular tools you recommended? Accelerate, I think. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really feel okay. okay uh, the... I must say, it's not for everyone. It's only if you're really paranoid about people who are going to get it. Okay. Mostly on the technical side of things. Wonderful. Okay, then. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, and thank you, obviously, Julian, thank you for so much for being with us and talking to us. Um, you can connect with Julian after the event on the links I've just shared in the chat. Um, so that's his LinkedIn and obviously the Accelerate website. Also, next Friday, we have another CTO Craft Bytes event uh, on uh, does the tech industry suffer from mass imposter syndrome? So that should be really interesting to check out. So do check us back next week. Um, thank you all for joining. And uh, yeah, hope you enjoy the rest of your week. So thank you very much again, Julian. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks a lot.